Life of Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Book 6, Chapter 3, The Outside of the Cup As Jesus made his way towards Jerusalem, the opposition became more evident than the enthusiasm. Although he attracted multitudes wherever he went, their supplication was giving way to accusation, and he had to contend more than to heal. Thus, when he paused to cure one who was dumb, although the people wondered, he became the centre of a storm of abuse. A familiar cry that had begun in Galilee had grown more confident. He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Words of life and power were stayed as Jesus patiently showed them their unreasonableness. They were not satisfied. Thwarted, they resorted to another challenge that had grown familiar, and simply served to show the meagerness of real evidence against him. They demanded a sign from him. Jesus dealt with them as he had dealt with their fellows by the lakeside at Magdala. Suddenly the voice of a woman was heard above the tumult. Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the breasts which thou hast sucked. Were it not for the Lord's answer, we should be thrilled with this evidence of loyalty at a time when he was sorely pressed by his enemies. But the Son of God was greater than that. He is never in need of the patronage of men. The words of Jesus are sufficient answer to those who down the centuries have echoed this eulogy of his mother. The woman's outburst was unrelated to the things Jesus had been saying. It was the word of God alone that could bring forth blessing in the fruitfulness of those who heard. Mary had been blessed in her submission to that word of God. She had heard and believed. There is a warning here to all who may be prone to shallow outbursts of affection for Christ. Our devotion will not be measured by them, but by the fruitfulness of our lives. Jesus now received an invitation from a Pharisee to dine at his house. This man had evidently not heard of the attitude of his guest towards the venerated traditions, he marvelled that he had not washed before the meal. This was an outrage. The washing of hands had become far more than a custom. It was now a religious obligation. As the guests entered a house, water was brought, and they washed one hand. When later they reclined at the table, a basin of water was once more placed before them and they washed both hands before beginning their meal. Bitter controversy had raged between the rival schools of Hillel and Shammai over the consideration of whether the hands should be washed before or after the cup was filled with wine, and over the position in which the towels should be placed for drying the hands. Jesus coolly dispensed with this elaborate mummery. His abstention had a devastating effect upon that large and distinguished gathering. The Pharisee would burn with shame, feeling that this rabbi had not only insulted him, but also his guests. To have invited one who had flagrantly set aside their cherished traditions would be severely condemned and even misinterpreted. But Jesus had only begun the lesson. Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools! Did not he which made that which is without make that which is within also? The meticulous care they took over their outward ceremonial, combined with their disregard for inward purity, made a farce of the whole conception of the Lord of purification. 
True purity is reflected from within rather than demonstrated from without. Next, Jesus, with growing sternness, turned to condemn their exacting of tithes from the minutest herbs. It was a practice which exhausted their religious energy, leaving nothing for the exercise of their true function of dealing justly and exhibiting the love of God. And all the time they were concealing what they really were, by a pretense of what they were not. Ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. At this point one of the scribes at the table intervened. He saw the Lord's indictment was more than an attack upon the Pharisees. It struck at the foundation of the tradition for which the scribes too were responsible. Therefore they were also insulted. Saying this, the scribe brought the Lord's denunciation upon himself and his fellows. The scribes were responsible for those binding impositions which robbed men of the last vestige of freedom, and did nothing to ease their burden. Certainly they perpetuated the work of their fathers. But their fathers killed the prophets, and they built their sepulchres. Solemnly the Son of God pronounced a judgment upon these men. The blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world should be required of this generation. They had the means and the responsibility for propagating knowledge, and had hidden the key. How prophetic the words of Jesus were was shown within the next few months just as the woe he had proclaimed was shortly to be sealed in their own blood. While provocation and denunciation proceeded within, commotion was growing outside. From all parts of Perea the people gathered to see Jesus, so that when he came out there was an innumerable multitude of people treading upon each other in their anxiety to hear him. Fresh from the scene within the house, Jesus warned them against the leaven of the Pharisees, revealing to them the contrast between the punctiliousness of these legal custodians and the loving care of their heavenly Father. There was a man who was not listening to Jesus. His mind was occupied with a sense of private wrong. Financial interests blotted out thoughts of a loving father who counted the very hairs of the head. He interrupted Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Jesus turned to the man whose thoughts were so far removed from the great truths he was revealing. Man, he replied, who made me a judge or a divider over you? He refused to arbitrate between two selfish claims, but he showed them the condition of heart in which no such dispute would be possible. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Without covetousness there would have been no claims to settle. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. To bring home the lesson, Jesus told the story of the rich fool. A farmer was blessed in the fruits of his field. The earth brought forth abundantly, and his barns were quickly filled. Because the man had forgotten the giver in the enjoyment of the gifts, his problem of accommodation became a crisis in his life. The words of David should have warned him, If riches increase, Set not thy heart on them. But instead he pondered the question, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? The solution could not have been far away. There were many barns lying empty around him, many mouths hungry for the good things which embarrassed him. But he was too busy glorying in the things of the flesh to look beyond the confines of his own estate. He made his decision. 
this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build a greater, and there will I bestow all my goods and my fruits. Then Jesus tore down the veil between action and motive, and revealed the true reason for his decision. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Here was a man who literally made provision for the things of the flesh to fulfil the lusts thereof. With what insight Jesus made the man address his own soul. But while the man was conversing with himself on his future delights, the Creator he had forgotten had determined his end. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. In a moment his foresight was turned to folly the years of comfort reduced to a few short hours, the accumulated treasure was to be enjoyed by others. Now his poverty was manifest. He could not willingly commit himself to God in the joyous consciousness that his true riches were yet to be. He would be torn away from his earthly riches to face a spiritual bankruptcy which would be final. So, said Jesus, is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Jesus did not attribute this tragedy to the fact that this man, blessed of God, was rich, but to his lack of real acknowledgement of the giver of every good and perfect gift. That grievous error led to the next. He loved his possessions, using them for his own fleshly ambitions, rather than as an instrument through which he could express his thankfulness in loving service to the need of others. The interruption was not, after all, a break in the context of the Lord's discourse. It was rather a warning which demonstrated the unhappy effect of self-sufficiency. So he was able to continue where he had left off, and tell them in words which will never lose their force, that man's sufficiency is of God. The only man who is truly rich is the man who is rich toward God. Nor will he be poor in the things of this life, for he is in the care of the one who feeds the ravens and adorns the lilies of the field. It was on this occasion that Jesus spoke for the first time openly of his return to the earth. Today these words become an urgent challenge. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Chapter 4 Except ye repent During Christ's ministry in Perea, a number of Jews described to him an incident which had occurred in Jerusalem when Pilate had sent his soldiery among the temple worshippers and mingled their blood with the sacrifices. Such tragedies were not uncommon in those turbulent days, testifying alike to the fanatical patriotism of the Galileans and the stern character of the Roman rule. But it is obvious from the answer which Jesus gave these men that their problem was merely a philosophical one. They were concerned, as the disciples had been in the case of the blind beggar, with the relationship between their suffering and their sinfulness. These men, they had argued, must have been guilty of some heinous sin, that God should bring so terrible a judgment upon them that in the very act of worship their blood should be required. 
Jesus, however, emphatically denied their cruel insinuations. Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He turned their attention from the tragic scene to themselves. Death will come to all. The means by which it comes is relatively unimportant. What is important is to recognize the evil of human nature and to turn to God in repentance. He reminded them of another tragedy. Eighteen men had been killed when the Tower of Siloam fell. Once more he emphasized the lesson. Unless ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We should probably have taken this warning only in a personal sense, had it not been for the parable of the barren fig tree by which Jesus related his warnings to the nation of Israel. In view of that parable, the words likewise perish assume a sombre aspect. Israel did not repent, and the day came when, with the Romans at their gates, strife broke out among themselves in that very temple. Once more human blood flowed with the blood of the sacrifices. Whilst facing the relentless enemy onslaught, thousands of Jews perished under the falling masonry of their city. With prophetic insight, Jesus spoke of those days. He told them of one who planted a fig tree in his vineyard. Because it bore no fruit after three years of careful tending, he determined to cut it down. But his hand was stayed for the moment by the intercession of the dresser of the vineyard, who promised to dig about the tree and dung it for another year in a final effort to save it. If his work on it failed, it should be cut down. Israel was unique among the nations of the world. It had unrivaled opportunities for bearing fruit and giving glory to God. In his wisdom and love, Jesus forbore to relate the sequel he saw so closely. He did nothing to encourage a fatalistic acceptance of doom. While the fig tree would undoubtedly fall under the axe of divine judgment, the personal aspect remained, and Pella was waiting to receive those who obeyed his word. So it is today. The judgments of God will be executed in the earth before his glory is finally revealed. That is a call to acknowledge the righteousness and justice of God and an incentive to recognize the evil of our nature and turn to him with penitent hearts. The following Sabbath Jesus went into the synagogue of one of the towns or villages of Perea. It was his first visit, but the way had been prepared for him by the seventy. His immediate approach would be heralded by the activity which he always excited, drawing the inhabitants from the surrounding countryside. A particularly distressing sight awaited him. A woman was crouching in the dim light of the synagogue. She was doubled up, her bones locked, her muscles dried away. For eighteen years she had suffered this prostration. Unable to lift herself, her eyes looked up into the master's face. No appeal was made. None was necessary. Jesus called her to him and offered her the release which her faith had justified and his love could in no wise refuse. Bending forward, he put his hand upon her rigid frame. Woman, Thou art loosed from thine infirmity. 
the cords that had long locked her bones together fell away, and for the first time for eighteen years she stood upright. In the joy of her freedom she lifted up her voice to glorify God. There were some who did not share in the rejoicing. Chief among them was the ruler of the synagogue. He had not the courage to accuse Jesus. He had probably heard of the rashness of such a course. Rather, he made his attack through the people who came to be healed, criticising them for thus profaning the Sabbath. There are six days in which men ought to work, he said. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But it was not so easy to evade the issue. The ruler found himself face to face with the one he had sought indirectly to condemn. Thou hypocrite! Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall, and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And so the day ended on a note of rejoicing and righteous refutation. Those who had thought more of their oxen than the infirmity of their fellows were ashamed. But the people rejoiced as they witnessed all the glorious things that were done by him. Jesus continued his journey through the country east of Jordan. Luke records that he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. There are quite a number who have found difficulty in understanding why many of the sayings of Jesus are repeated in the Gospels at what is evidently a much later time in the ministry. It has not been ignored by the critics. We have to remember that on this journey, which only Luke records in any detail, Jesus was breaking new ground. His teaching was familiar in Judea and Galilee, but not in Perea. The questions which had previously been asked earlier in his ministry were asked again by people who had never heard him before. They were questions prompted in nearly every case by the impact of the teaching of Jesus upon what the people had been taught by the scribes. Jesus dealt with these questions in words similar to those he had used when answering the Galileans. Frequently in his discourses he had used the same figures and appeals. As so often happens, our faith in the gospel record is enhanced rather than weakened by more careful study. We find quite different reactions on the part of the religious rulers in the three different regions of Christ's ministry. In Judea, which means principally Jerusalem, there was little desire to hear his teaching. He faced not only bitter opposition, but downright persecution. Nearly all his discourses were rudely interrupted, some with a crude arbitrament of stones. In Galilee, Jesus was given every opportunity to expound his teaching. It was the only place where the Sermon on the Mount could be preached. Except in Jesus' own town of Nazareth, the opposition confined itself to polite questions until roused by the arrival of emissaries from Jerusalem determined to poison the atmosphere. Even then the change was gradual and was only hastened by the hard sayings of Jesus himself. In Perea the attitude was different again from either Judea or Galilee. The scribes and Pharisees there had obviously heard a great deal about Jesus, but the majority had no contact with him. They were perhaps embarrassed by his decision to spend some time in their region on his way south to Jerusalem. They had neither the astuteness of the rulers of the temple, nor the open-mindedness of the rulers of Galilee. All they wanted was to persuade him to leave them as soon as possible. 
the enthusiasm of the people added to their discomfort and forced to their hand. But they were clumsy in their methods and collapsed under direct attack. Thus we notice that the ruler of the synagogue made no attempt to challenge Jesus directly for his Sabbath healing, nor did he speak to the woman who was healed. He made an attempt to oppose Christ by attacking the witnesses. The same awkwardness is seen afterwards when the Pharisees tried to persuade him to leave them. They took advantage of what was possibly a rumour, but their effort may not have even that redeeming feature. They warned him that Herod sought to kill him. It was palpably false. On the only occasions we have any record of Herod's attitude to Christ, we find he was interested in him and anxious to see him. It was a stupid ruse, yet one which had apparently been thought out. Had it succeeded, it would have had several satisfactory results. It would have put an end to his protracted stay in their country. It would have hastened his journey to Jerusalem, where they knew his arrest was imminent. And it would have betrayed in him a personal fear which would have had a profound effect upon the attitude of the people towards him. The reply of Jesus exposed their intrigue. They had advised him to go away. He told them to depart and to see Herod. Tell that fox contains a, a subtle implication to these foxes to go and concert with this bigger fox. Such threats did not affect him or his work. He had his ministrations of love to perform, casting out devils and curing the infirm. That work will go on today and tomorrow. There is a footnote here. The expression today and tomorrow and the third day can only be taken figuratively. It was a current colloquialism. Back to the text. It will come to an end, and then, his work accomplished, he will be perfected. But he will depart when his work in their midst is finished, for, he says with deep irony, it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. So it was that the rulers of Perea joined those of Judea and Galilee in rejecting the Son of God. There was no sign of life in any of the main branches of the fig tree. All this careful tending was of no avail. Yet there were some who heard and believed. They were being prepared for that repentance and conversion to which Peter would call them when this greatest of all God's prophets had gone to Jerusalem to die and to be perfected. One of the loveliest aspects of the ministry of Jesus was the way in which, in spite of these severe setbacks, he never despaired of men and women, nor ceased exhorting them by precept and example to aspire after the perfection of God.